Carter, the power Brian. Good evening, good sir. Uh, I actually don't want to be on here anymore because I'm loving your backdrop so much. It just kind of shrinks everything. You got baseballs, you got Joey B, got all kinds of good stuff. Congrats on uh, 900. Thank number nine is a big number in uh, Louisiana sports lore, and it's uh, good to be with you, man. Why is 900? No, just the number nine. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, and, I got Burrow, I got Burrow Jesus right here. My buddy Todd painted this. Okay, good. So, Burrow, Burrow Jesus is in the house. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but yeah, Blake, good to be with you. I'm very happy that Flaugé exists, uh, bringing us out of the dead uh, yesterday. Her and Moro and uh, loving life right now. All right, so look, we got tons to get here to you. Even though it's episode 900, we got the Kim Mulkey stuff. We got to talk about yeah. the game. I actually don't want to lead off with that. I actually want to talk some football before we get to the the, the gossip part of uh, of our show here. Um, so, Carter, we were out of practice, or I was out of practice, and we there was a lot that we could take from what we saw on Saturday. Brian Kelly giving the full media access on Saturday. Let me just start off with a generic question: uh, What is the biggest things that stood out to you so far this spring? Now that we've we've seen a full practice, yeah, it's uh. The, the people that were there saying that Sage Ryan has turned a corner when last year uh, he was very inconsistent and maybe it's just a case of him finding the position that he, you know, best fits. You know, at this point, Blake, you always want to be, oh, you got an earthquake going on? What happened? I absolutely just kicked the shit out of my camera. <laughs> I love it. I, I was starting to get worried. I was like, what, what's, what's, what's going on? But I why have you no idea what's going on here. But, but why you fix that? It's a uh, say dry. And that's obviously the big story. And, you know, it's dominant uh, scrimmage performance for all of you to witness. And also major burns, right? These are two LSU defensive backs who have uh, struggled mightily in their roles. And, Obviously, they are in new positions, and they are obviously killing it up to this point with uh, Major Burns playing the nickel star uh, position and uh, Sage Ryan playing the free safety. And obviously, Blake, uh, Brian Kelly briefly mentioned this in his press conference, the backup quarterback battle, not only the backup quarterback battle, the backup battle everywhere. Um, Because it seems at this point, Blake, we have a good idea who the first one to one and a half players are on the offensive unit. It's now a battle for who's going to back up all those guys. All right. Bear with me here because of course something bad like this happens when you are trying to, there we go. Now you look good. You look good. You look good. You, don't, don't do hickey it anymore. It's fine. You're, you're golden. All right. So golden. There you go. Well, thank you. I really much appreciate that. Okay. I get very conscious. I just kicked the absolute shit out of that thing, too, by the way. It was not fun. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, uh. I don't know, Carter, if I can go yet that Sage Ryan has turned a corner. Let me tell you why. The, the two picks that we that we know that he had for like, – like was in big-time moments. Chris Hilton beat, beat – both defenders on a post and the post that was run by Chris Hilton was massively underthrown by Garrett Nussmeyer exactly. and it got picked off. But the good thing was, is that Sage Ryan read it and then reacted and then went up and then picked the ball off. That's number one. Number two, he, he jumps slant route to CJ Daniels that he takes for a pick six on Garrett Nussmeyer. I got a hot take on this. I think he knows the the signals. I think he knows the calls. Yeah, no, that's calls. always yeah. Oh, so he knows, and I think that he knew because he had probably been beaten on that slant so much in practice that he jumped it and read it. Here's the thing with that though: if he if he develops that way and is in film and watches, like, hey, if Miller Moss has this tendency to throw a quick slant in this formation. Maybe he does that again. Yeah. But I do think that the overall, overall, I do think that the secondary absolutely balled out on Saturday. Here's another one. Deshaun McBride might not be able to be to stay off the field. I, I don't think that you can keep him off the field. He was bodying up everybody. He he was like glue 
to these tight ends, and more importantly, to these inside receivers. Yeah, Blake, I, I, I go through and I do my own grades on every high school player. And uh, I just base it in nothing based on their LSU careers or anything like that. I just do my own predictive analysis of who I think the best players are. And at this point, Deshaun McBride um, had my highest grade. So uh, I, I I do agree with you. I, I do feel um, he could be a year one guy. He actually did get a year one grade for me. That's not one that I like to hand out all too often. And I think only two or three guys in this class ended up getting that uh, for me. So I'm with you on Deshaun McBride hype. Uh, the athleticism scores have always been there. He always tested well in Spark, which it's its own like little rating system at camps. It's normally a pretty good sign of good athleticism um, when you're going up against the best. So I, I'm a huge McBride guy, and I, I'm all in on the hype here. And congrats to Penn Jones. Look at you, man. I know, man. Penn Jones sent in a massive $99.99 super chat. My man. I greatly appreciate it. Well, I'll just – I'll take what he, he has given here, and I'll put something up here and just say, hey – this is the this is what Penn Jones bought. That, there you go. Good job. Good job, Penn. Penn, obviously, Greg Penn, Robert Penn Warren. It's a, it's a, it's a deep Louisiana name. So there you go. Good stuff. I greatly greatly appreciate that, Penn. Thank you so much, buddy, for sending that to us. Um, you are a legend for doing that, Carter. Let me take the opposite. So basically, we've started off with the defense here. So let's stay there. Yeah. Um. This defensive line is in serious trouble, specifically in the interior. Now, I don't know if this has a lot to do with this is just a damn, damn, really strong offensive line. I, I don't know that. What I do know is I saw through four team periods or three team periods, them get absolutely abused. <sighs> yeah, they're in a lot of trouble there. Um, but – that's why you pay a defensive line coach over a million, right, uh, to, to come in and, and fix what looks to be the biggest position group question mark. And there's issues, obviously, with all three levels of the defense. And one thing that concerns you, Blake, uh, with the interior of the defensive line is that really affects your second level of the defense, right? And that's obviously Greg Penn and, and Harold Perkins at this point, uh, being those softball guys, and obviously the Weeks brothers being in there as well. So, yeah, it, it's it's a tough unit. You hope the um, I, I think we can all agree that Jacoby and Guillory can can be a, a good rotational piece. I don't know if he is a bona fide superstar SEC starter level uh, player. I think he could develop into being like a stud uh, defensive tackle. But you're going to need more than that. You're going to need Jalen Lee to take some type of massive uh, year four leap here. That might not happen. Um, and then you get into Sean Washington. You get into a few of these other names, Blake. You kind of cross your fingers that Dominic McKinley can step in and, and be that guy right away. Or you hit on some of these portal guys. But Blake, as you know, Linemen are tougher to get in the portal. Skill guys are a lot easier to get in the portal, not only in terms of transition, but in terms of volume. There's just more skill guys in the portal than there are linemen. So uh, you just cross your fingers, hope some guys take big leaps, and, and hope for the best. Carter, they're rotating in Preston Hickey. Yeah, I mean – and. Preston is really well liked as a, as a walk on guy, but that's not where you want to be uh, at LSU. I don't, I, for what it's worth, I don't think he performed bad, really. I, I don't think that he did. But uh, again, the problem with that is, man, I, I mean, Carter, we're, we're talking about this defensive line just getting absolutely run over. And yeah. would we not see some form of like them? coming up and making plays in, like in spring you 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 would hope so and hopefully those things uh do begin to happen Blake and look uh it it's it's also one of those things where the defensive tackles who left are also very freaking good right, right. they're they're all going to get drafted even though they necessarily didn't play the absolute best some of that is scheme fit and and them being inconsistent and hurt and whatnot um, 
anytime you lose three draftable defensive linemen who actually all three of those DTs have actually improved their stock uh, since the end of the season. They've actually all moved up uh, draft boards, Wingo, uh, Smith, and Jefferson. So, yeah, it's it's always tough to replace that type of capital. But look, the first defensive tackle that's going to be selected this year in the NFL draft is going to be a guy that was coached by – uh, the guy who's coaching your DTs now. So Byron Murphy is that guy, and he wasn't the most coveted player. So you hope you can get some big rear ends coming in uh, uh, during the April uh, wing, uh, window, and, and they could come in and help you right away. Well, we don't have a choice. Carter, I, I, let me ask you this. For sure, it is the biggest deficit of talent since Brian Kelly has been here. Outside of quarterback, has there been a worse unit? of personnel like going into a spring or a fall oh you're talking about this current yeah this current d-line room interior Uh, d-line room maybe i mean it's 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 definitely the 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 weakest it's been in forever right I, i just don't i don't know of a room that i that i had massive worries about like even you could say linebacker wasn't great last year Okay, well, the year before, uh, Micah Baskerville was not that bad. No, he was a very good player. He was a very good player. Okay, so I I, I just – I don't remember a unit being this bad. I mean, Carter, they got pushed around. Now, here's another thing to that. Tyree Adams moving a little bit over to the offensive side of the ball. Emory Jones out. Brian Kelly basically blowing it all off saying, listen, (laughs) my man's beat up a little bit. He got some stuff going on. He ain't going to be here. He don't need to be here. We got Tyree Adams anyway. Yeah, yeah. Carter, he, he looked the part. I mean, he just – he played well. He did well. Um, I'd be real with you. I didn't really realize that Emory Jones wasn't out there until I started focusing on it. Yeah, and this is where, you know, Tyree Adams really steps into the fold because last year – it was impossible for him to play uh, because you had two really good starting offensive tackles that were for the most part healthy and your number one offensive tackle coming off the bench was Lance Hurd. So if you're left tackle, that's what Tyree said. Exactly. So normally I'm a guy that wants to see something out of a player as a true freshman, like a glimpse, a snap, a play or something like that. But it was nearly impossible for Adams to play last year because of the the, the rotation. So now he is offensive tackle number one coming off the bench. And yeah, I've heard he, he's looked really good. I actually really liked his tape uh, coming out. He actually had he a pretty, I remember we had that conversation. Yeah, you actually I really thought that he could be up there more. You were debating him and Hurd. Yeah, I, I thought he was I, – I, I don't think that that gap was as wide. I thought Hurd was a better prospect, of course. And I, 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 th- I think Tyree can can really be something. Well, what happened now? What happened to your chair? I'm having a hell of an episode. Oh, wait, so so Pin, Pin, Pin puts that uh, hundred dollar super chat. He's telling you go, go get you a, a, a Peter Millar, man. Go get you. Some, I go get some lumbar. Down. Got, got to get some lumbar I'm support, seeing, man. Uh, you, do not, you do something 900 times, you don't have to worry about shit behind you. I can lean back, which was what I was doing. I hit it. I got hit by a golf ball, okay? And oh, that fell I, off? Oh, my yeah, God. that fell off. The LSU golf ball fell off. So oh, then I'm like, oh, shit. Then I, I hit something on my chair, and I go all the way down. Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> but, it's, me, it's me. It's my gravitational force, uh, Blake Rafino. Yeah, so look, Tyree Adams – you just I, I mean you you didn't miss Lance Hurt by the way Weston Davis is coming in who probably now I'm not going to say he's going to take a red shirt because I think the kid's freaking uh, like a, a just over overwhelming athlete so you're not going to be able to do that but I do I really do question like hey man you get somebody hurt now you're can now you can just plug and play a little bit I yeah. gotta be a little real with you I don't know now if Miles Frazier does not have a little bit. No, stay with me here. I don't know if Miles Frazier doesn't have a little competition of moving Emory Jones down to guard and Tyree Adams moving to right tackle. It can happen, but it's it's not it's going not to. It's not going to, but, but 
but he's good. That, that, that's a good sign. You know, if you look at Tyree Adams. And you know what they be. could do? They could 1,000% go full 2019 when Ed Ingram and Adrian McGee rotated. Yeah. Or what you can do if Brian Kelly really wants to get uh, a, a you sex. Can put him, you can. Uh, you can. Uh, yeah. In, you, in doubles. That you can Dan Skipper that thing. You can uh, unbalance. Right. You can unbalance line it and outgap teams in in the running game. So there's Dude, a lot. Can of things you imagine can... that? Can you It'd imagine that? It'd be fun. I mean, look. By the, the Lions, way, Caleb Jackson's your running back, who we're talking about next. Right. You're the Lions do it. 49ers do it. A lot of the best offenses do a lot of unbalanced sets. The Chiefs do it, but they do it more just bringing in more tight ends. But it. It can it can be very very frustrating for defense if you can just outnumber them, especially knowing that ends are, are smaller now. So uh, guess what? You could do it and and just pound teams to, to oblivion. Let's go to um, Caleb Jackson very quickly. Um, dude is just a freaking bowling ball. I mean, Carter, they were tackling in the in the third team period, like bringing dudes to the ground. He flatlined at least three dudes. And, I mean, like he's running dudes. And, and, and here's the problem. When they're getting to him, he's running them over, but he's faster than all of them. Like people keep saying, maybe, man, maybe he's a baby Fournette. I call B. He's faster than, than Leonard ever was. Oh, really? You think so? I, I think in a short yardage, he gets up quicker than Leonard was. I thought Leonard was a little slow getting to the line. Okay, but I, I hope you're right. Jackson, hope. They ran a couple of plays from under center and pistol. Brothers, like he's oh, he's Ali Broussard, but a little smaller. He's you know who he really kind of reminds me of. Let's go. Let's hear it. I don't know if he's not a little bit smaller. Joe Adai, LeBrandon Tofield. He is an old school running back. He's an old soul. My man was out there, didn't have gloves on, just running dudes over. And every time they hit him, I kept hearing him say, Padat! Padat! And I'm like, hey, dude, he was running dudes flat over. Yeah, I, I'm a big Caleb Jackson guy. He he was actually number three guy um, uh, on my grading system last year, and, and he's just a fantastic athlete. And we saw it last year. Obviously, his next development is becoming a, a, a good pass catcher and a more well-rounded back, and I think that's next in line for him. Normally, like I said last week on the show, Blake, we get really excited about the incoming freshmen. Most of them are not ready to play. The guys that really propel your program forward are the guys taking that huge jump from year one to year two and then year two to year three. And obviously, Caleb – when you go from year one to year two, you know what SEC speed is like. You then begin to add more nuance to your game. And athletically, he is truly breathtaking. So hopefully that continues uh, to develop under Frank Wilson, and hopefully he'll be uh, an 800, 900,000-yard back next year for LSU. Last thing for football, and I'm sure we'll continue to talk about this, but just to limit time because we got to get to Mulkey, which freaking sucks. Um, no, you worried about Nussmeyer throwing three picks in practice? Not really. Um, I do think, and I, so I wasn't there. You were there. Um, but you know I, that I, it happened. And you, I mean, you yeah, know, yeah, you, I, know, I know. And, and I, I had them, you know, broken down and, and people, and I saw a commenter bring up wind. You know, wind doesn't play as big a factor in like actual stadiums because, well, stadiums are huge, right? Wind plays a bigger factor. The ball died on Garrett on that post. Right. The so, ball died, and it, it, look, if it was just normal conditions and no wind, the conversation you and I are having are Garrett. Scary. Well, well, and because the first one he threw to Kyron Lacey, Kyron mossed Jordan Gilbert and went over his back, okay, like his name was uh, – I'm going to throw a name out there – Jonathan Prothrow. Remember oh. Paul Crow when he made the behind the back catch against Southern Miss? Yeah, yeah, for Alabama. I thought his name was Tyrone Pro Throw. Oh, Tyrone Pro Throw. Okay. I, I think that's I, I don't know. I, I okay. Pro Throw. Pro Throw. Right. When yeah. he when he made that catch over the back, 
That's what happened to Jordan Gilbert. So that was the first one, but the second one got picked. But then the, the I mean, the first one got picked. The second one, he's throwing a slant, C.J. Daniels, and it gets picked. By right. the same guy, I might add. Yeah, I'm, I'm honestly not worried about it. And Blake, this is how I've always been about QBs. I'm fine with you throwing picks in practice. I really am because that gives you a mental note to not do that in a game. That I attempting this ambitious throw is something I shouldn't do in the game. Now, none of these throws were particularly ambitious, throw across your body, across the field kind of thing. I guarantee you that Sage Ryan knew that that post was coming and where he was going, and I guarantee you he knew where that slant was going. Yeah, and that's why, like, I I do – practice breakdowns of all SEC teams. And I always include that uh, when there's a scrimmage portion. Um, there was actually a play in Arkansas practice where it was clear the player knew the play. So there's a lot of that that happens. Um, and look, I'm not worried about it with Garrett Nussmeyer. There is a like a little concern because Garrett does have a history of interceptions, but in this kind of setting – I'm okay with it. In fact, I, I think it could be a good thing because it gives this defense a little bit of confidence moving forward. It does. The only, the only thing, the only thing is, and I'll continue to say it, it don't matter how good that DB room is. And, and quite honestly, Carter, I got to be real with you. Here's a hot take for you. I'm not a thousand percent sold that Harold Perkins at inside backer even last year was a bad thing. I think that your interior of your defensive line is so bad that they do not help your inside backers. No, they don't. And that's what concerns me. So basically when Nuss was off, Carter, you know what happened? Joe Sloan, I'm just going to tell you because I, I got this one a little source. Joe Joe Sloan said, watch this, son bitch. He started running the ball with Caleb Jackson and said, all right, y'all want to play this game? Watch what's about to happen to you. Right. And so that's not really why I'm concerned about it either. But Sage, come on, dog. Yeah, we, know, well, you know, we, we know you know the play. I, I will say this about Harold Perkins as far as the inside linebacker experiment. I There is a piece of me that thinks that they bailed on it a little Way too quickly too because Florida State, we learned when they were clicking, they were a top three offense in yeah. college football. And you when know they what were else clicking. you learned? Your D-line sucked. Yeah, and your first game as a linebacker versus Florida State's game is brutal. There's so much – they knew that going in. I, I know that they knew that because someone that knows Florida State knew that going in. They're like, okay, we're, we're going to pick on this linebacker group because it's a brand-new unit. And with all the counter and misdirection and all that BS – it's hard. It is really hard if that is your first game playing an interior linebacker role. So mm-hmm. hopefully this does work out for LSU, and um, and and hopefully Harold learns quickly because they, they desperately need him to be the guy that they expect him to be. I'll say this in ending. If the safeties, all safeties, continue to play the way that they're playing, Jake Olson might have been the, the biggest hire, and Blake Baker is accredited to that for bringing him over. Right. Carl, let's talk about this Kim Mulkey thing. Look, here's where I stand on this, and I think it's big, and I think that you and I, I'm going to go behind the curtain just, just once. You are the guy that I run to every time when I when there's something going on with the media and a coach because you yeah. have more experience in media than I do. And yeah. you are, you grew – I say you grew up, but you you, were, you educated yourself in schooling in media. So I'm going right. to ask you this, okay? Break down to me what this thing with Kim Mulkey is because I understand what she's saying. I don't necessarily think she's wrong, but I do have issues with two things, not really issues, things I would have directed her to do. Number one, just wait for the damn article to come out, and if you're going to sue him, sue him. I exactly. understand what she's doing there, okay, in reference to she's trying to end – this, like, you know, maybe somebody at the Washington Post says, hey, you can't publish this because she's going to sue us. Um, and she kills the story right there. But yeah. the problem with that is, is that now everybody is going to is saying that they want to see this article. And it puts more eyes on her. 
It puts more eyes on the institution. What do you think about what's made all of this with Kim Mulkey? Yeah, Blake, I, I was lucky to um, have a journalism degree. Um, I'm lucky to know a lot of people in the, in the public relations media sphere. Let's start with Kim's side of it. I would have never, ever released a statement like that, especially an extended one. Um, the, the fact that it was a longer clip uh, fed into the algorithm and then just sped the story into to, to hyperspeed. If I was under Kim's wing, I would have done whatever it took to not release a statement unless the story actually is going to be something that you really do want to get out in, in front of, which we don't know what, what's in the story. Uh, so that's that's the first thing. I do agree with you. Obviously, as far as the journalism side of it, we, we have Kent Babb, right, a, a very respected reporter, wrote a great book on Allen Iverson and, and so on, and he wrote a story. Also, you're going to hit piece on Brian Kelly, too. Right. So the details of that story was in a negative light towards the, the LSU football program. Right. I don't I don't think it was the absolute most negative story. I, I've read it multiple times. I I think he made some salient points in there, but it 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 did paint LSU negatively. And I think Kim has a reason uh to be skeptic uh, skeptical of a national guy digging into whatever might be going on at LSU. After um, the last thing that he wrote about LSU was also negative. Right. So I, I also understood why Kim's guard uh, was up, right? Because that story could be uh, horribly slanted, right? You know, th this reminds me of a New York Times story if you, uh, about a year or so ago that involved um, – Olivia Dunn, done. That was really poorly done. Uh, I thought right. the story. I, I remember tweeting it out. I thought there were some interesting pieces of that story uh, th that I disagreed with. But it's 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 one of those things where you have to be careful, obviously, with with uh, the national media. I think mostly the national media does a good job, but for some reason, this this is is here. I I will also say this. I do think the worst thing about this whole thing was Pat Forty. All right. This is this is this is the worst thing about this whole thing. Because he stole somebody's story. Yeah, you don't do that unless you work for the Washington Post. Unless the reporter do you think, told you, do you think Bab I I, I I I don't I don't know, Ken. I've met Pat a few times. I, I don't know. I I honestly really, really, really don't know. I thought that was horrible. Number one, that's not the organization you work for. And number two journalistically, that could sway how the story is edited. Because let's just say I'm the editor of the Washington Post. Now, that could lead an editor or a group of editors to say, well, we need to make this story look, we got to embellish the story even more because there is so much hype going into it. And if this story isn't something that is truly you know, revolutionary about Kim Mulkey, then what uh, someone who didn't even work for our organization hyping it up with a random tweet during a game, that honestly was the most irresponsible thing I've seen out of anyone because it's not your story to tell. And it can move how the story is actually worded, right? You got to remember, this is a written story. Um, you know, when you and I go on here, people can see our facial expressions. People can see our tenor. And our emotions people, are on our sleeve. Right. And let's just say like with like 10, 15 minutes ago, uh, you know, if someone wrote out what you said about the defensive line, it, it would be taken. Well, Blake just hates our defensive line. They, they want us to fail or whatever when that's not what you're doing. Right. It's like, Hey, this is what I saw. I'm cheering for these guys. I want them to turn a corner. That's the thing. When you write a word, it, it's a completely different thing. So every last word matters and how that story's edited. I think 40s tweet will affect how the story's final copy comes out because there's going to be so many people with WAPO subscriptions that have a vendetta out against LSU that they are going to want to appease um, because of, of all the hype going into it. And that's the thing that pisses me off more than anything, Blake. There is very little about this story. Like, we only have one tweet from one national reporter. No one else has tweeted out about Buzz uh, about this story. And then the second thing we only have uh, Kent Babb tweeted something out acknowledging that he is working on something, and that's it. 
that's why I, I would have told Kim, don't say anything about it and let you see what happened. So it, it's going to be interesting. I'm sure as hell glad we won this game uh, over the weekend because then there would have been everyone pointing, hey, it was these guys that tried to take us down. And well, they, uh, try to blame, they try to blame the that Middle Tennessee, the game was close because of Kim Mulkey, the story that came out. And look, uh, do I do I think this team could have been distracted with how poorly they played in the first half? Maybe, maybe so. Or maybe Middle so. Tennessee, who that's got thirty wins and beat. I think Kim said five Power Five teams. Hey, man, they might not be bad. No, yeah, no, they're they're a really solid team. And, and by the way, you you beat them by twenty. So the ultimate score's got to matter. Yeah, yeah, right. I, like, <laughs> yeah, and I I think ultimately, Blake. When this story comes out, unless there is something truly specific in it, it's going to be a nothing burger. That's the thing. Ultimately, specificity is what matters. And the thing is, there are so many people out here that hate Kim for whatever reason. There's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of people that that feel a certain way about her, whether it be um, Baylor era or even LSU era. They 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 just don't like her, and it's on both sides of the island. She's just not a very uh, she's not the most affable person in the minds of many, and this well, is just, especially the vocal left. She's not. Yeah, and I I even see people on the right that that feel this way uh, about her. More right leaning people, and that's the thing. You know, a lot of legendary coaches are like this. Uh, they, they just are. They're abrasive. That's part of uh, what makes them great. Is they they had this. I don't give an f about what you think about me. I know what's best for my team, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to win. Uh, mentality, and that's part of what's always been Kim Mulkey's mo. Here's the issues that I have. Number one, it's what Ken, what Bab is doing is not journalism. Not to me. Well, we got we got we got to wait to see what the story says. Well, let me let me let me say why we do know what the story is going to be about he's told kim he's well let me back up he didn't he did not tell kim he told what word he told the administration what it was going to be about and what the questions would have been along with that he he acknowledges from what i have been told that he spoke with 60 um unanimous or uh Sixty players that want to name uh, their names, name. How do you say that? They want to be anonymous, right? And I, yeah. Okay, I have a massive problem with that. Massive, because they're all anonymous. Because they're all anonymous. The problem that I have with it is basically for two reasons. I think the Washington Post. I saw something, and look again. Not trying to be political here. But the, that the Washington Post has put up more retractions in the last two years than anyone, okay, because of false stories and things that they've said, either from a political side or how they've done things. But number two, you legitimately wrote a hit piece on Brian Kelly and put negative uh, a, a negative light on LSU oh so long ago. How can you write a hit piece on Kim Mulkey and not name anybody? It looks like you're attacking LSU. Then what I do think happened – I do think that Forty was told by Bab to release it and get it out there to get buzz about it because he didn't want to do it. Because I think Bab, who had been trying to get in touch with Kim for two years, has been hitting dead ends, and he got Pat Forty, who knew, Bab knew what would happen when Forty, okay, tweeted that out and the traction it would get. I think that this is highly calculated on both sides. But... When Kim goes out there, this is what I would have refrained from her from saying, regardless if it's true. By the way, I don't care that she said it. Like everything that I don't, I don't care about anything that she said. When you talk about the reporting and reporters, and you call you keep calling them sleazy. She called reporters sleazy in her post game yesterday. Okay. When you do that, people are gonna put four little letters. By, with your name, it starts, it's spelled M-A-G-A. And that is what the problem has been in our opening press conference. She says, I'm going to take this God dang mask off. We don't need these damn masks. While the governor is sitting in the front row, they're I love Kim. I'm going to support her. But there is going to be this. Okay, I say all that to say, going to stand with her. 
But this is going to continuously happen with her as your head coach when she's here because she don't give a go good goddamn what anybody thinks. And you're yeah. going to defend it. But the problem that we, we got to define here is where is the – you know, I don't think she's crossed any line whatsoever. I, again, can't emphasize enough how much I stand behind her on this. Yeah. I, I think that there are some things that could have been left out that would have not gotten LSU – into this light but i will i will finish with this okay i hate right now i'm going to use that word hate no let me not use it because it'll get it'll be used out of context i'm strongly starting to dislike covering women's basketball oh it, it's it's a hassle it, it is I, I i love the sport blake but it, it's it, it it there is uh, and look there there there's this in every sport but not it, like not like this yeah there's so many things about about the sport you for Kim Mulkey you look like and and look go down Blake Blake J Rafino on Twitter Carter I had people from the far left okay like rid like going after me viciously like as a human okay. That is insane. Yeah, it, honestly, it's just going to come down to what the story says. That's that's it. I I'm going to need something specific. I I'm fine with anonymous sources. I am. Uh, it just, but like Even you said, when he wrote a hit piece on L, on Brian Kelly and LSU. Yeah, I'm. I'm. What's I'm, the difference I'm, in him doing it than Pat Forty? Well, if if. It passed journalistic standards, and the editors uh, vetted these anonymous sources. Then, sure, if if if, but if that's, that's the problem, truth, the Washington Post has been proven that they don't do that. Well, we'll we'll just I, honestly, we'll just see what the story says. I will I will I will tell you this though, Blake. Th this is just part of it with 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 Kim Mulkey being your coach, and it's, it goes back. Part of it is why she's successful is. A lot of great coaches had this IDGAF mentality uh, to, to towards everyone, no matter how much more difficult it it might be uh, for for their jobs and and their surroundings, and and we'll we'll see what happens. But honestly, Blake, part of it is we don't even know when the story is going to be released. So it's going to be released. Yeah, I, I, that's that's the thing. There's. And, and and the Washington Post has to release it now. They don't have a choice. Yeah, and that's the thing. There is no deadline on this. Uh, they, they can they can release it whenever they whenever they please. They might release it later this summer when the hype of all of this dies down if they don't have anything on her. Um, and that's where it's going to be very interesting uh, from from a journalistic ethics uh, perspective. I, last thing I'll say on this, okay, and I'll be done. There's a reason why I don't watch the NBA the way that I used to. It got too political. I don't think it's political anymore. It's not anymore. Carter, you remember five years ago, shit was bad. Yeah, the it, reason it, it, they're going to the play-in tournament. Carter, you got a college women's basketball game getting more views than any game in the NBA Finals. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a silver guy. I, I think even outside, he's ruined, he's ruined the NBA. Yeah, I and 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 that goes back to like a lot of our great sports leaders were were a holes. David Stern was uh, an a hole, <laughs> and he knew it. Uh, he he was, he's David Stern. Yeah, he, he was the best commissioner ever in the NBA, and I strongly disagreed with a lot of the stuff that he did. Uh, but he was definitely better than Adam Silver, and you know it goes back uh, to league structures, right? If you start letting money and everything uh, affect you, uh, it, it it could take your league down a spiral. And hopefully, Greg Sankey uh, is 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 watching some of the mistakes that Adam Silver makes, and hopefully, he doesn't make those same ones. By the way. Knock on wood, Creighton leads UCLA right now, twenty-eight to nineteen. 
So you might be heading back to Ohio. Hey, I'll, t- I'll tell you this. LSU was the only team in the first round uh, or in the second round to play a team that had a first round upset. Middle Tennessee was the only team to pull off a first round upset. So you look last year at LSU's run to the final four, the breaks that they caught were massive for them to win it all in terms of teams getting knocked out. They didn't have to play South Carolina. They didn't have to play the one seed Indiana in their own, uh, their own bracket. So you need these, especially if your roster is as thin as it is. And, and, if Flaugia and Morrow keep playing the way that they that they are and you get some better performances at HVL and Angel, watch out. And Michaela's playing really well right now, too. So what makes you the GOAT, man? Fantastic tonight. Sorry that my chair fell down. Sorry that golf balls fell down. Sorry I, my big lemon pepper steppa hit the camera and 